Hello and welcome to Can't Make This Up. My name's Kevin, I'm your host, and every couple weeks I get to sit down with historians and journalists and just chat a little bit about what their latest research is and the works they've been publishing. Today my guest is Nicholas Reynolds. Uh, Nick is a historian of espionage, he has a CIA background himself, uh, and he has used that expertise to publish the book um, Need to Know. World War II and the rise of American intelligence. Uh, So we talk about where the American um, espionage and intelligence apparatus came from uh, during the very crucial years of World War II. Uh, It's an interesting story, and uh, I think you guys will learn a lot. I certainly did. Um, If you want to pick up a copy of Need to Know after you listen to this episode, uh, I've provided a link to you down in the description of this episode in your podcast app. Uh, If you're brand new, of course, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, uh, I encourage you to subscribe to the podcast on whatever you like to listen to um, so that you can follow along as new episodes come out. And then if you would like to follow me on social media, I'm at CMTU History on all the social media platforms. So here's my conversation with Nick Reynolds. The You Can't Make This Up History Podcast Bringing you strange but true things from the past It's not the average history that you learned in school We're bringing you the heroes and bringing you the fools And stories that are just too crazy to believe The stranger than fiction and super unique Hi Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. How are you today? Uh, we're having a pretty, we're having a gray day in Washington. I think we're going to get a little bit of the storm that's been going on down south. Mm. Well, hopefully you'll be, you'll be safe and you'll be careful. We're, we're on high ground. So. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, you are the author of um, Need to Know, World War II and the Rise of American Intelligence. Um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? I understand that you have some uh, connection with the intelligence community. That's true. I, and I, uh, a shorthand way of uh, explaining my career is to say I've held two of the best niche jobs in the U.S. government. And one of them is officer in charge of field history for the Marine Corps. And uh, that was like being head of a little news bureau and sending historians out to capture history as it was being made through uh, oral histories, observation, photographs, paintings, and collecting artifact, artifacts and so on. The other niche job I held was uh, being the historian for the CIA museum. And I did that for about five years. And that is, they're both relevant to this book, but the CIA museum part is more relevant Uh, because that fed almost directly into this book. The work I did there was on the history of OSS, which was the Office of Strategic Services, uh, America's World War II intelligence agency. Before that, I did other jobs in the CIA and uh, in the Marine Corps, and I went to graduate school. I wrote a book. uh, And uh, last but not least, I've always been fascinated by World War II. It has been a part of my life ever since I can remember. My parents were both, I don't know if the right word is veteran or survivor of World War II. Um, My mom was a civilian in Hungary uh, while the Russians and the Germans fought over the country. And uh, my dad was in the State Department stationed in London while the Germans were launching V1 and V2 Uh, missiles at the city, and and then he was part of a team to collect uh, German foreign office documents. The idea was, if we beat the Germans on the battlefield, will they try and create a Fourth Reich from overseas? So uh, they wanted to find any documents that might relate to that. And long long story short, uh, World War II has been in my blood for years. So you combine that with Um, my uh, professional activities in the intelligence world 
And the result is this book, Need to Know. Well, uh, I'm really excited to talk to you about it because you bring uh, a lot of authority on the subject and it's a, uh, it's a really interesting uh, interesting premise because you tend to think of um, you know, much of our intelligence um, apparatus in the context of the Cold War. Uh, so it's really interesting that you've taken a look at um, you know, a little bit before during World War II. Um, so I guess to start with, you know, before the Second World War, uh, what are we looking at? What was, um, you know, what was the American approach to espionage? Not, not quite crickets, but close. Uh, so <laughs> uh, there wasn't a whole lot going on. There were a few. Uh, I, I like to say it was the, um, I like to say it was the cottage industry phase of American intelligence. There were a few practitioners uh, working on their own and isolated from other practitioners. Some of them were very, very good at what they were doing. Uh, the Army and the Navy both had uh, small cadres of code breakers who were working on Japanese codes. Uh, the FBI was already in existence, but not really in the intelligence business. And there was no real, uh, there was no mechanism for collecting strategic intelligence. For So if you look at you look at what's going on in Ukraine now. We and, and other powers, great powers, have many ways of analyzing Putin's speeches, uh, looking at where his troops are, uh, trying to analyze the history, uh, you know, how Russian, the Russian army deploys forces and, and things like that. And then, then taking the president and the decision makers in Washington, they, Taking, taking them reports that say, okay, we think he's gonna do this or that, and here's why. We had nothing, nothing at all like that before uh, the outbreak of World War II. Policymakers, decision makers are, are kind of somewhat blind to what's going on out in the world, um, or at least what's uh, going on privately out in the world. Yes, yeah, so what, what you want an intelligence agency for is to try and get to, uh, you know, to uh, to look behind, not just put to put everything together, both what's what the what somebody like Putin is saying, and, and then to, uh, if at all possible, look behind uh, his desk, uh, look into his closet, look into his file cabinet, and see what uh, he's really, uh, you know, what the what what the rest of the story is. Uh, you know, there's some. There's a great example. So the people who did a really good job of this in World War II were the Russians. The Russians had the Soviets, I should say. Uh, and the NKVD had uh, a large stable of spies in the United States. And what they wanted is exactly what we're talking about. They wanted to understand the Roosevelt administration to predict its moves to see where they might be able to um, place a little bit of leverage, place a little bit of pressure. And, and they had, they, they had uh, members of Congress, they had uh, the number two guy at the Department of the Treasury, and they had, the, uh, had a couple of senior uh, officials in the Department of State. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on. Most of these people, uh, were ideologically motivated in some way. That is to say that they had, uh, the Soviets were able to appeal to them as either fellow travelers or members of the Communist Party and say, we're working for a better future, uh, come join us. And of course the depression plays a role in that when uh, a large number of people said, well, this is the collapse of capitalism. Uh, something better is gonna come down the street. But my point here, uh, is to say that the Soviets had what we didn't have. They had uh, recruited spies who were reporting on uh, the uh, secrets of the Roosevelt administration, such as they were. Or you know, you could you also get a benefit if it's not exactly a secret, but if it's a if it's an insider who says, "Hey, the president always likes to do this or likes to do that." Uh, that can be worth a lot to a foreign power who's dealing with that that president. Um, and you write a little bit in your book that, um, you know, even the British are involved in this way more than we are. 
Uh, yes, the British, uh, com especially compared to us, are old hands at, at uh, espionage and intelligence in general. And they've the MI5, which is the rough equivalent of the FBI, uh, MI6, uh, rough equivalent of OSS or later CIA, and uh, they they were formally established um, just after the turn of the century, that is to say, the 1900s. And um, they, you know, the 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 Brits were were doing the things that we weren't doing. They weren't quite as good as the Soviets. I don't. Uh, I'll, uh, uh, you know, the the Soviets had. The, the the Soviet mentality was such that that conspiracy ruled everything. So so you 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 almost had to spy to live. That was that was their that was their approach. Uh, the British uh, were somewhere between them and us, uh, a little more relaxed uh, than the Soviets, but they were definitely in the game and developing the right mentality. Uh, and they also had a more systematic approach to code breaking. Code, in, in the British system, code breaking and uh, general intelligence, uh, espionage, uh, were under one umbrella. In the United States, they were uh, quite separated. Uh, so, what was the turning point? You know, what what made decision makers decide? You know, what we need we need to get into the espionage. Case? Well, there's two there's 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 two things that uh, I uh, look at in my book. One is uh, the British. The, the British are pretty lonely in 1940 after the Germans <laughs> basically take over the European continent. Sure. And, and they, you know, if you if you think of what uh, the the so the British and the French were at war with Germany. Uh, the British had the fleet, right? And uh, Britannia ruled the waves. Still, uh, the Royal Navy was uh, powerful and. Uh, experienced and uh, uh, it, it 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 was a force to be reckoned with, but the British army is was a a, a wee thing compared to the French army. The French army uh, had the power to rule the continent, and so between the two of them, if you're in the United States and you're you are pro, uh, you're anti-Nazi, you can go. Oh, the the Brits and the French together have got it. You know, one's got the land, the other's got the sea. And then the land part's gone, and all that's left is the sea. And so the the uh, British start casting around for alternatives. Where can you? Where, who can I rely on now that the French are gone? And and it's a pretty short list. You don't want to go over and rely on the Russians because at this point they're sort of they're in a strange alliance with the Germans. Uh, and uh, besides which. If you're a, the if you're a, a conservative British politician, as Churchill was, um, allying yourself with the Soviet Union is an unnatural proposition. So that really leaves the United States. So what they do is they try and and appeal to the United States. They have a couple of uh, three spy offices here, and uh, they plant articles in the newspaper. Uh, they uh, take over radio, they, they literally buy a radio station and, um, you know, uh, change, the bro uh, change the broadcast so they're pro-British uh, and pro-intervention. Uh, and um, then they also want to have uh, an American intelligence organization that can work with them, that can support them, and that can also uh, have an effect on strategic decisions. Uh, this is a little bit of a holdover from World War I when the, uh, the guy who was the de facto head of British intelligence in uh, uh, the United States wormed his way into the Wilson White House and uh, you know, would go there for dinner, would discuss policy with the president, uh, would even go on vacation with him. And uh, you know, they would sit around brainstorming what, what the United States was gonna do. Uh, an amazing uh, coup for an intelligence service, uh, and and they they were kind of thinking in similar terms in uh, in 1940. So that's one thing. Uh, the other uh, big event that changes things is uh, Pearl Harbor, and um, Pearl Harbor is um, is a multifaceted intelligence failure. 
Um, you know, we could talk about Pearl Harbor for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, but the, the, the one thing, one important thing to take away from Pearl Harbor is that, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's a tremendous wake up call. It's like 9-11. It's like, uh, you, you know, uh, bad things can happen to you out there, even if, even if you don't want to get in, you know, if, 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 if you're not going to war, maybe war is going to come to you. So, um, it, it's a, it's a, um, uh, uh, you know, you, you it, that event mobilizes the country, uh, literally and figuratively. Uh, it's, it's a, it's an emotional, um, it's an emotional thing. It's a, you, you know, a, 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 but at the same time, you can look at it as an intelligence failure, right? Because uh, the intelligence, there was no American intelligence that was capable of predicting it. So I'm not saying that if we'd had a great intelligence machine before Pearl Harbor, we would have predicted it. But I am saying that if you don't have a good intelligence machine and something like Pearl Harbor comes along, your chances of predicting it, predicting it are very low. So, um, you know, those are the two, two game changers, uh, British desperation and the attack on Pearl Harbor. All right, so the United States decides, you know, they got some major catching up to do, uh, and they start building out an intelligence uh, apparatus. Um, can you tell us about how that started to take shape and some of the, the personality rivalries? Um, that that come into play in, in deciding what the intelligence service should look like. So there, there's a you know part of it as, as your question uh, uh, suggests part of the answer, uh, which is there's this huge food fight uh, on who's going to do <laughs> what. And good, good way to put that. It, it's not it's not always pretty. Uh, you know they there's this. Uh, a gentleman named William J. Donovan, who's a New York lawyer, um, Republican, uh, prominent Republican, and an interventionist, right? So he he believes the United States should get involved in, in uh, European uh, events. And he comes to Washington, and the British say he's a great candidate to head up an American intelligence outfit. Uh, and, and And so... Uh, he starts moving down that road with British support, and the you know there are all kinds of people in Washington who go, hey, wait a minute, why him? You know he's he's kind of an outsider, and he, you know he's not. They, he's they, not they called him Wild Bill. Wild they? Bill. They call him Wild Bill for a reason, and and um, one of the one of the players in uh, Washington, senior Army intelligence officer said, you know, if there's a stray ball on the field, uh, Donovan will grab it and run with it. And so, um, you know, he, what they're saying is you better keep track of your balls and make sure that uh, Donovan doesn't uh, pick the football up and run with it in, in a direction that you don't want him to go. So, uh, and then J. Edgar Hoover, of course, he's been, he, he's pretty well established by the time the war starts. And uh, so he, he says, I can do it all. FBI can do everything. You, you know, it's almost like the, the officer on the scene of an accident who says, nothing to see here, folks. We've got this under control. And uh, so Hoover thinks he can do it. The military think they could do it. Donovan thinks he could do it. And, and to make things even more complicated, um, FDR has a couple of uh, friends who he gives money to to run sort of a private spy bureau for him. That's, that's actually his preferred solution is to have, um, you know, have guys that uh, he, he has something like a slush fund in uh, at his disposal. And uh, he channels this to a couple of a organ a couple small organizations. Uh, one of them's in the press club here in DC. One of them's up in New York. It's known as the room. And these are kind of gentlemen spies who go around and, and ask questions and look at things and then come back and have a uh, have a cocktail with the president and uh, tell them uh, tell him what they saw. Um, this is this is far different from professional intelligence. This is like this is sort of like a informal. This is more like a a a, a state politician uh, collecting information on possible rivals 
in his next um, run for office. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very disorderly initially in Washington. Some, or, some order, you know, we, we, and we don't, but we don't just stay there. We don't, there is a war to be fought. And so we, we do start moving in the direction of um, putting intelligence assets on the ground and fighting the enemy. And one, the code breaking gets a lot better as the war goes on, again, with British help. Uh, but, but we were doing, we, we made progress on our own as well. And, and what happens is, is that code breaking gets professionalized. And uh, in, 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 so instead of, uh, it, it turned a code breaking product, a code breaking, let, let me walk you through the scenario. So uh, the embassy, okay. the foreign ministry in Tokyo sends a secret message to the Japanese embassy in Washington, DC. And it would go, uh, it, there's a couple of ways it could go, but uh, one of them is to just transmit it through the ether. So uh, the US Navy or the US Army snatches that in, uh, in package of uh, encrypted data out of the air. And they, there, are, uh, there, there are intercept sites uh, in this country along the path that Japanese messages take. So then the message, that package of encrypted information is sent to Washington and uh, it is uh, by, by uh, Pearl Harbor, we have the ability to read Japanese the diplomatic traffic. And so uh, someone uh, decrypts it, right? So they, they uh, take the encrypted data and make it into plain text. Plain text, of course, is usually in Japanese. So uh, then they have to translate it. And what they're doing before Pearl Harbor is carrying that around to the decision makers in DC. So it's not analyzed, it's not finished intelligence. It's the same message that the Japanese ambassador is going to see. And it'll be, you know, uh, close the bank of Japan, uh, the branch in New York, uh, tell the foreign secretary, uh, the, the uh, American, actually, the Secretary of State, tell him this or that. Uh, and here's our negotiating position. So um, after the war starts and we start to get more professional about this, we get better at the technical process that I just described, but we also add uh, analysis so that the president is not being handed a message that uh, is, is the same message that the Japanese ambassador sees. He's being handed a little report that says, today for the first time, uh, Japanese ships were ordered to turn around and uh, head for home ports, which is one of the things that suggests the war is coming. Uh, and so uh, this is this is what we see as the war goes on, and and we, we you know we we don't re we don't reach perfection, but we certainly get a lot better than what we had before the war. Um, so this um, uh, professor professional service that starts to emerge, um, why is it why is it different than the the military why isn't it just run through say the army why, why does the professional intelligence service look quite a bit different well so there's there's two or three strands at, at work here the code breaking is mostly run by the military uh and it but it, but to make things more complicated the people who are professionalizing it happen to be wall street lawyers who are just very good at assembling large bodies of data and making them usable. And then, uh, you know, uh, down the street and up the hill is the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, and they are they're they're taking on the tasks of espionage, uh, secret. They call it the secret intelligence branch. Uh, they're trying to recruit spies. They're trying to steal secrets. They have a research and analysis branch that is trying to take, turn those secrets into usable information, into, into sophisticated reports. And then they have a special operations branch, which is about uh, running operations behind enemy lines. So, you know, think, think paratroopers, um, you know, dropping uh, uh, behind the lines in France and working with the French resistance before and after D-Day. So, um, you know, these are two of the main 
activities that are going on. And of course, it, it make it even more complicated. As I said earlier, there's also uh, the power center in the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. So you, you've got at least three sets of balls um, being juggled uh, during the war in Washington. So as you've said, though, you know, I mean, the, despite its imperfections, we, we start to figure this intelligence game out a little bit uh, over the course of the war. So, so I guess, um, you know, final big question is, is what did the, these new agencies contribute to the victory in World War II? So um, my, my, so there's a couple of ways to answer that question. Uh, so the first thing I'll do is say, we can't quantify the contribution. Sometimes you read in a history book that um, because we had uh, this code breaking capability, the war was shortened by two years. Well, you know, I, I think that's problematic. I think I, I think you can say that code breaking contributed to victory, but I don't think you can put a number on it because there's just, you know, history is just too full of of uh, ifs, ands, buts, wherefores. Uh, there's just too many moving parts. So I don't like to make categoric statements like that, that, um, you, you know, in, intelligence shortened the war by three, it, something like that. This so, is like where when you see the decision to drop the atomic bomb saved yeah, X amounts of soldiers' lives. Yeah, I mean, that's problematic too. Um, I mean, sure. I, that's, that's a little more, a little more clear cut. But that's problematic too, because you you know you 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 just don't know what would have happened. Right. Um, you know the Japanese might have fought on. There were there were people who said we need to fight until there is nobody able to lift a rifle and pull a trigger, uh, and and so that would have meant the deaths of of, of many many more uh, Japanese and Americans. So, but anyway, the the uh, there are there are battles where you can see intelligence did make a difference and arguably laid the groundwork for success. Uh, one of them is Midway, that's early on. It's uh, before the American intelligence machine uh, really hits high gear, but uh, the uh, naval intelligence tells the commanders, hey, uh, the Japanese fleet is gonna be in this location and their target is Midway. Uh, and uh, that enables the American admirals to position their ships accordingly. Um, but even, you know, that lays the groundwork for success, but it doesn't ensure success because, uh, you know, the, there was rough parity in the number of carriers. And so if, if things had gone wrong, uh, the American carriers could have been sunk in place of the Japanese. I mean, there's just an enormous amount of chance, even when you when, when the conditions seem right for you. Uh, a, a more uh, clear-cut example, perhaps, is D-Day, um, when we have a lot of resources and intelligence tells us basically where the Germans are and uh, gives us an idea of what they're gonna do. And this, this again, is a to a large extent, a code-breaking success, uh, not, a, uh, not an espionage success. I mean, the OSS pl certainly played a role in this, but the code-breakers, they, they can locate the German units, right? And they can figure out that, that uh, you know, this package of transport of information is from, from uh, uh, this unit, and uh, and and follow you know place them on the battlefield and say okay these guys this is what these guys are doing and um, so that's a, a it's called order of battle information that's just huge uh, and then uh, aerial um, so taking taking pictures right aerial reconnaissance take pictures of the of the fortifications that's huge uh, and then. Uh, the messages that the Germans and the Japanese transmit about the upcoming battle for France, uh, that's huge too. That says, that, that basically outlines the strategies that they're going to adopt. So intelligence lays the groundwork for D-Day, um, but again, doesn't 
it, it enables success, but it doesn't uh, ensure that there will be success. Um, but it's but but I, you know I go back to the argument I started with it that uh, you know if you don't have it, uh, your chances of failure are far better. If you do have it, your chances of success have increased, but you never get to hundred percent. There's always uh, you know there's there's always the the wild cards. There's always the guy who fights the you know Japanese or uh, German commander who fights to the last bullet. Um, there's always a malfunction, possibility of a malfunction on your side. Uh, you know, a, a, a ship or a unit misses a, a, a crucial turn and uh, is not present for the battle. So, um, you know, a lot of moving parts, but I, I say if uh, Pearl Harbor was the big failure uh, in the intelligence world, then D-Day was, uh, in a sense, the corresponding success that made up for it. So you see an arc from like uh, no, uh, very few assets and a, a, a system that, that didn't exist and what did exist didn't work very well. And then uh, that's 1940-41. And then 1944, uh, D-Day, you see a system that's working pretty well, you know, not perfect. Um, you know, a, there's still a lot of friction here and there, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's good enough to, with, with, uh, luck on the battlefield and, uh, you know, and the sacrifices by a, a, a lot of brave men who waited ashore, um, we, we do get the foothold in Europe. That is a lot of progress in three years. That's yeah, it really, I mean, you, you know, we, we you, you, you could do glass half full, glass half empty, but uh, analysis depends on your point of view. But uh, basically, the U.S. comes a long way, uh, and something like OSS. So you know, is is OSS a well-oiled machine at any point during the war? Mm, no, not really. But I tell you what, <laughs> they went from zero to let's say you know fifties and trending towards 75 on a scale of 100. And, and uh, you know, they, they're basically starting with nothing. You know, it's, it's one thing to plus up the army. There's always been, there's always been army bases. There's always been, uh, we've always had uh, munitions factories. Uh, we have a cadre of trained army officers that you can, uh, you know, you can do train the trainer. You can take guys like, like Patton and, and Eisenhower and you know they're already professional soldiers, and they can create five or ten little patents and Eisenhower's. But in the intel world, there's nothing. There is there's almost nobody who uh, understands intelligence as a profession and can say, "Hey, um, you know, here's here's how we need to do this." So yes, um, bottom line, we've come a long way in a short time, and you know that's that that we, we need to pat ourselves on the back a little bit. Um, that's American ingenuity. That's the, uh, you know, the British system works because they're all kind of the same, right? They went to school together. Uh, they, they, uh, I believe every British prime minister is a graduate of Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, you know, uh, they've served in the same regiments. They go to the same clubs in London. So it's not really a problem for them to get on the she same sheet of music. Um, that's their strength. Our strength is different. Our strength is that we have this amazing diversity. We have so many skills, uh, so many different kinds of people uh, and resources in the United States uh, that there are amazing things that we can do uh, in a different way. And that's what happens in the intelligence world and uh, during World War II. Well, Nick, I, I really enjoyed um, talking to you about this. And uh, you know, I really like your book. I'm a big fan of um, you know, spies are cool, and and the history of espionage is really interesting. Um, if somebody listening, you know, and we just kind of went bird's eye view over over what you've what you've written. If somebody would like to learn more and would like to pick up a copy of Need to Know or learn more about you and your work, uh, where can they go? So one place they can go is uh, my website, which is Nicholas Reynolds Author, uh, one word, no spaces, uh, dot com which talks about my bio and this particular book. You can also go on harpercollins.com and to the author page 
uh, for instance, if you just typed in need to know, uh, this book had come up and the reviews and a little bit of uh, discussion about the book. Um, and there, I, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, there are just so many good books about World War II and it's, it's, um, it's the subject that keeps on giving to historians. And it seems like there's always another story, another twist, another reinterpretation. Uh, I hope I've contributed to the process and, and that, the, that, uh, that we never run out of, that we, that we never stop being fascinated by World War II because it was, it was an amazing event and it, it changed, it really changed America. I mean, we, so, so we go from, if we're just looking at intelligence, uh, we never go back to 1940. We never go back to like this this country with you know a few intelligence assets here and there. Uh, we now have a pretty robust intelligence apparatus. Depending on how you count, there's something like 18 agencies, and it's the war that where this starts. It's World War II where this starts, and um, you know and changes the country. Uh, I'd say I say forever and uh, mostly for the good. All right, well, uh, Nicholas Reynolds, thank you very much. Kevin, it's been a, a great pleasure. Welcome back. Uh, thank you for listening to another episode of Can't Make This Up. Uh, big thank you to Nick for taking the time uh, to hang out with me and chat a little bit about the history of spying. Uh, definitely enjoyed it and learned a lot, and I hope you guys did too. Uh, again, if you would like to read a copy of Need to Know, it's a great book. Uh, there's a link for it uh, down in the description of this episode. And then looking ahead to next week, i uh, got a lot of stuff coming out here in October. Uh, next week, I'll be back again with uh, Over My Dead Body. I got the chance to talk with a uh, journalist and uh, to some extent a travel writer uh, and historian. Um, Greg Melville, who written, wrote an excellent book about the history of America's cemeteries. Uh, so look for that to come out next week. So until then, have a great day.